Well, I hope you brought a Bible, and if you did, would you make your way with us into the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's where we are this morning. We've been making our way verse by verse in this book. We continue in it this morning. If you didn't bring a Bible, there are Bibles around you. Every other chair hopefully has a metal cubby with a Bible there. Hopefully you could grab one page number on the screen and really longing that as we just approach this this morning, that God would speak to you through his word. It's one of the reasons why we want you to see it so you can consider and think through. But we also want to just invite you right now even to ask for that. You know, I think about First Timothy. It really is a, a book that we've titled or called a series, Blueprints, God's Design for the Church. That here God helps us to get a picture of his intention for what his people, his church is supposed to be in this world and to draw our lives into that. So I just want to invite you into a space where we would ask that God would speak to us this morning. Or we ask that he would just give us ears to hear what he's wanting to speak into our lives today. I'm going to pray for that, but I'm inviting you to ask as well. Would you join me? Father, I so am glad that you are a God who is at work. And God, you know us. Help us. Would you give us ears to hear what you're wanting to say to us this morning? Open up your truth and to that extent, just expose lies and help things to become clear that we get it and make it effective, Lord. Make your truth just alive and active in our lives, producing in us the things that you have for us. God, you have a way of giving that to us that is both together, that we together hear, but also very personal. God, bring us into the pattern and plan that you have for our lives in this morning through your word. I'm asking that you would do that in us. We ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Encourage one another daily. That's a command given to us in the scripture. Hebrews 3 gives it to us, but it's referred over and over in the Bible, and it draws us to a simple understanding. We are a people that need encouragement. We are a people that need just a, a voice that would sometimes just strengthen and encourage us in the things that he has. In fact, it's meant to be something that we do for each other daily, and I hope this morning is a part of that. In fact, a little bit more, this section that you and I are in in 1 Timothy that, that runs in this last part of chapter 4, it is entirely that. It's a number of commands and things that Paul has given, but it's so intensive in the Greek language that it's all about just speaking into our lives now. They are present participles that have the idea of just longing that these would be things that are present and continue to be present in our lives. And it comes across, well, it's meant to come across as encouraging. We began that section last week, and for you guys who are here, we began looking that he's calling us to be those who would be good servants or pleasing to God, that we would live that way. And we contrasted that with the idea of being a slacker, and that's not where we want to go. But again, it's meant to be encouraging. And he said, if we were going to do that, well, then we need to be nourished in the truth, reject profane fables, and exercise ourselves towards godliness. That if we want to think about it this way, that spiritual health, it really is eat the right thing, don't eat the bad things, and exercise. <laughs> it's not the, in some ways, it's such a cool analogy, and I want you to hear it as encouragement. But it is that last phrase, exercise yourself towards godliness, that we want to talk about this morning. Before we do that, though, let's read it. Would you notice with me there, beginning in verse 6 for context, what we covered last week and picking up where we are all the way to verse 8 this morning. Verse 6 begins this way. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith, eating the good stuff, and, and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. I want to just pause there and say that's what we want to think about this morning. This call that God says, exercise yourself towards godliness. And I want to just drill down in that for a moment, and then next week we'll come back and kind of complete that whole little section, putting it together. But today I just want you to think about just this incredible thought. In fact, begin this way, this idea of exercise. It's kind of fun because the word that's literally used is gymnazo in the Greek. It's where we get the word gymnasium. 
So that's just a little bit of fun. It's like, okay, gymnasium. I mean, like, you should be that, doing what a, that, this spiritual exercise that's kind of like going to the gym. You should be doing that. Some of your Bibles will translate it differently. It'll say train or discipline as a translation of that. But all of it flows out of this call in our lives to do that. Now, with that, it gives us this contrast between physical exercise and spiritual exercise. Why don't you notice it again with me? I'll just read the last part there of verse 7. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Verse 8. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So exercise ourselves. And he gives us this contrast between bodily exercise, physically doing that, just what that would look like in our life, and this place of spiritual exercise, kind of just this contrast and comparison between them, and that's exactly where we want to go this morning. Now, with that, let's just dive just for quickly to think it through. He describes bodily exercise in an interesting way. Again, there in verse 8, for bodily exercise profits a little. Pause there. It does, he says, it profits a little. I want to begin by saying that might sound diminutive. It might sound like that's a disregard of physical exercise. It's anything but that. It doesn't come across that way in the Greek language. It's not like saying that's a waste of your time or not a good thing to do. He's saying it is profitable. It's just a little profitable. It it is profitable, though. It's a good investment. It's not a loss. And all by itself, that's a good thing. To look at something and say, this is something that if you invest into it, it will have a good return. Now, some of you have been there. You've sat down with a financial counselor. Maybe you've been thinking about your retirement or something like that. And, you know, you talk about investments. And one of the things you're wanting is, I want something that's going to give me a return. (laughs) I don't want to lose. I don't don't want to lose. And I just want to tell you, this is a gain. This is an investment that has gain to it. It's good for us. It's a good thing to invest into physical exercise. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And this actually becomes an endorsement of that. Now, you guys get this all the time. I'm certain it's stuff that you've heard since you were a kid. It's continually held forth. But I just want to just briefly tell you it is true. Physical exercise is a good thing. It has so many benefits. I mean, it can help your heart and keep you from heart disease. It can do things that would lower your risk of diabetes. It strengthens you. It can help your, your, your cognitive abilities, your brain function. It can help you sleep. I mean, there's so many things that physical exercise does, and I could give you a longer list, but I think, again, for most of you, you're aware of that, that you would sit there and think, okay, that's, that's, there is something that exercise is not a bad thing. It's actually a helpful thing in our lives. I could add to it that for us in Christ, it's good stewardship. Our physical bodies are a gift from God, and taking care of those is is good stewards to what God has. But still, he says it only profits a little, and part of that understanding is because it's only limited to this life. Physical exercise, it benefits us in this life. But at the end of this life, we move into eternity, and whatever you've invested into that, that's, that, that, that's where it ends. I know that you guys get this, and I hope it's not crass to say it this way, but let me just try. No matter how healthy you are, no matter how much you exercise, you're still going to die. And when you die, all that that investment that you did into that, it's over. It wasn't for anything longer than that. That's not a bad thing. I mean, in one sense, to, to make that just invest in, that's a good thing, but it's also important to kind of see that limitation, that that's as, as big as it is because there's a better investment. But it's not an either or, by the way. It's a both and. There's a better investment that that becomes a spiritual investment. This place of spiritually exercising. That's what he says. And so you might just again notice it. Verse 8. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things. Having the promise of life that now is. And of that which is to come. Godliness. Spiritual exercise. This place of of, of just taking whatever that is and doing it, he says it profits in everything. I just want to tell you it's so true. That if this would be a part of your spiritual life, it would bless every area of your life. For example, it would bless your marriage, it would bless your family, it would bless your job, it would bless the the way that you enjoy life, it would bless the, the way that you enjoy friendships. Everything that's good, I mean, godliness becomes something that isn't in some limited capacity, 
it touches everything. It affects everything that is now. It affects all of life now, but it has the incredible blessing that it goes on past the end of life, that what you invest into into this aspect becomes something that has a return that goes on forever. Now, that's just exciting. I mean, I enjoy you to think about it that way and, again, see the contrast. Now, he's telling us what it is. He tells us that we are to exercise ourselves towards godliness. Godliness is an interesting word, and we talked about it a little bit last week. We'll talk about it more next week when we finish up this section. Uh, But godliness really comes from the old English word God-likeness. And that's really a pretty good definition. It has the idea of growing to be more like Jesus, becoming more in the image of Christ. And we talked about that last week for those who were here, how Ephesians tells us that we're seeking to grow up into Christ, that we're seeking to become more like that. And in many ways, that becomes almost the definition of who we are, right? I mean, for most of you, you even use the word Christian. And you may or may not know that, but Christian really has the idea of little Christ, Uh, that we are an image of Christ, that we are this picture, that we are seeking to live that. And that's a good, hey, that's what we're after. So whatever this is, whatever spiritual exercise is, it's after this place of saying, God, I want to be more like this. I want to pursue Jesus. I, I want to grow in those things. And it's the means by which we do that. So that's what we want to think about for a few moments this morning. I just want you to take this analogy and apply it. Now, we're going to do so in a number of ways this morning, but I want to just tell it to you this way. I hope to give it to you in such a way that I just begin you on a process of understanding, that I begin you on a process because if you can take what you understand about physical exercise and then apply it into spiritual exercise, it would be amazing. It would would really transform some things, and maybe for some of you it's only going to be encouragement of what you already know. But I do know this. For some of you, if you'll let this work into your life the way that I think God wants it to, it'll destroy some lies. Some lies that maybe a permanent, you just hadn't even thought it through this way. You hadn't even, like, of course, that makes sense now. And and, and hopefully becomes something that calls you forward into the things that God has for your life. So let's do it this way. Let's kind of center our thoughts almost around some exercise slogans. The kind of things that, you know, if you were to go into a gym and you would see, you know, some motivational poster on the wall or some bumper sticker kind of thing, I want to just give you a few of those that you would see and then talk about them, what they look like physically, and then apply it spiritually. So let's take the first kind of one. I mean, just you've heard it, right? Just do it. I mean, it becomes in so many ways one of the greatest challenges to physical exercise. You, You guys know this, right? But let me just remind you. Nobody exercises by accident. If you're going to exercise, it's something you choose to do. It's something that you do intentionally. It's something where you look there and think, okay, you know, I'm going to do this. It's not saying that a job couldn't pull you into some things, but real exercise, it happens on purpose. It happens because you see it, you recognize what's needed, and you choose to do it. You must do it. You have to do it on purpose. In fact, for most of you who understand this, that's part of the problem, right? I mean, that's part of the problem, that we know we ought to, and then sometimes we struggle with doing it. I I think about it years ago, I ran across a... um, a Garfield cartoon that just so kind of pictured my own struggles with it. And it has this whole place where John and Garfield are having this conversation. And John's like, you know, I think I'll take a walk. And Garfield's like, yeah, me too. And then they sit there for a moment. And then John's like, okay, well, let's go. And he's like, wait, I thought we were just thinking it. <laughs> you know, I was like, I mean, I mean, actually do it? I mean, I thought we were thinking about walking, not actually walking. And if you're with me, and that, that's the problem. I mean, so often it's like, yeah, I'm thinking about that. Yeah, I think, I think I'm going to start getting, I'm going to start doing that exercise. I'm going to start riding the bike. I'm going to start running this jog. I'm going to, I mean, I don't know what exercise looks like in your life, but you would probably recognize with me that becomes one of the biggest struggles. Moving from the good intention or that I should do into actually, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm going to do it. And that becomes something that you have to do. In fact, only you can do that for you. Only you can be the one that really makes yourself to be someone that moves into that. Now, that is absolutely true physically, but it's also true spiritually. And that's what I want you to think about for a moment, because there is this analogy that we begin to understand that what is so needed in our Christian life is this place where we are actively and intentionally 
pressing forward into the things that God has for us. In fact, there is a sense of understanding that it is something that we need to do. In fact, would you notice the way it just says it, that top phrase up there? Exercise, notice, yourself towards godliness. Exercise yourself. I mean, yourself, you have to do this. You might understand it, but here's the simple deal. For some of you, somehow there's a disconnect here. I mean, you totally understand it physically, but spiritually, somehow there's some kind of disconnect. Again, here's how it works. Some of you this morning, you're serious about exercise. You know who you are. We know who you are. We're a little jealous, but hey, nevertheless, um, you know who you are, right? I mean, you just, you're, you're someone who takes exercise seriously. You're constantly working on it. In fact, you notice Someone comes into church and they begin to lose a little bit of weight. Maybe they get a little bit, you know, toner, and immediately you're aware. You're like, and, and you ask them. So, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Is it CrossFit? You know, are you running? Is it aerobics? Is it spin class? I mean, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, what is it you're doing that's, that's bringing you to this place? Because you're just aware. I mean, you're just, you're, you're, you're just you, you zone in on that and you have that kind of conversation because you connect. Now, that's just true, and that's helpful, but somehow it doesn't always work that way spiritually. So that you see somebody who's doing well, maybe they're growing in Christ. Sometimes you just assume, well, that's just probably in their DNA, you know, some kind of like they're just special that way. Instead of you going to them and saying, like, so what are you doing? I mean, you're reading the Bible? I mean, how do you do that? I mean, what, what, kind of, what, are, what are your disciplines in your life? What's the things that you're doing? That are, you know, how's your prayer life? How, do you, how, how are you doing some of the things that are, well, spiritual exercise? Now, quick FYI. It doesn't actually give us a list of the kind of things that are spiritual exercise. In fact, it just leaves it in that big picture. So I'm going to do the same. But certainly it would include things like our Bible reading and prayer. I mean, he had just talked about that a little bit before, that we're sanctified by the word of God in prayer. But it's so many more things. But here's the deal. What I'm just telling you is if, if you saw that, you would know, hey, somebody's doing that. Or again, for some of you, you're not, you don't exercise really well and you keep intending to. Even right now, you're like, I know, I'm trying. I think about it, you know. But you know. You know that that's what's needed. You never look at somebody who is physically healthy, who is toned muscles, who's, who's just, you don't ever look at them and think it was an accident. You always look at them and think, man, man, they're doing it. And they're actually like going to the gym. They're actually doing those things and you understand it. But again, I'm telling you, you don't always see the same spiritually. And that's the problem. That's the problem. So much so that for some of you this morning, you may have actually believed a lie that somehow that doesn't actually work for you. That somehow you've thought that spiritual maturity would happen with age. That, you know, like if you're a Christian for five years, if you're a Christian for 10 years, certainly just somehow just magically you become more mature. It's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. You can be a Christian for five years and 10 years and 20 years and 30 years and 40 years and 50 years and still be incredibly spiritually unhealthy. And it's not because you haven't been a Christian because you haven't been exercising, because you haven't been pursuing those things, because spiritual growth doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen without you saying, I want that. And what do I need to do to get there? And how do I move forward to be more like Christ? See, I think about it this way. Philippians 2, verse 12, 12 and 13 are some of my favorite verses. And Paul says it this way. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's a great beginning. Again, it's an encouragement. He's writing to this church. He says, you guys are an obedient people. And what's beautiful, he says, about their obedience is it's not just a because somebody's watching. He says, even when I'm not there, you're trying to do this. And he says, I'm so proud of you for it. I'm so proud of you. But then he just encourages it. He says, you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the phrase we want to think about. But before we go to, to that, we need to understand it's connected in the sentence. The end of the sentence in verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, can I just be clear? This is probably my favorite part of the sentence. I absolutely love this thought. I love the work of God. I love thinking it through, and I love the idea of him giving us desires, and I love the idea of him giving us ability, and that's absolutely true. In fact, please catch this clearly now. 
everything I'm going to encourage this morning is not disconnected from this. In fact, it is connected. Uh, to honestly step forward into the things of Christ, you could never do it in your own ability. It always has to be an abiding in Christ. It always has to be Him working it. But what I want to challenge you is to understand that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Because again, it's put together in a sentence where he says, here's what I want you to do. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That it's not an either or, it's a both and. Yes, God's working. Yes, that's what we want. But if you want to see this come together, you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that phrase fear and trembling is a fascinating phrase because it has the idea of a recognition that you need to be all in. Kind of thinking about it this way, maybe it'll be helpful. Imagine that you decide you want to run a marathon. You don't just want to run the marathon, you'd like to win. I mean, not everybody (laughs) enters a marathon to win, but let's just say you do. You're like, okay, I'm going to start getting ready. I'm going to start pressing myself to that. But if you're aiming at that, then you would have this kind of mentality that knows It's going to take you giving your best, and even your best might not be enough. If you give it your best, even your best might leave you lacking, and you still might not win the race. That's the idea of fear and trembling. It has the idea of a recognition that I have to be all in, and even that's insufficient. That's not a place that I can look at this and think it can happen without my help. I have got to do this with fear and trembling. And I just want to tell you, there's this beautiful picture of living out the Christian life that holds God's good work in our life, but also recognizes, but I can't be lazy about this. We live in a weird generation that some people focus only, only on God's aspect, and they almost will say things like, let go and let God. (laughs) You know, it's God, it's all God, you know, it's just, it's all Him. And, And I know that for some, they may be thinking about some good things like abiding in Christ, but it's, it's not a place where you'd let go and you do nothing. There are others that only focus on, you know, what they can do and never lean on God. That's problematic, but they go hand in hand, and I just want you to see it this morning that there's a place that you and I are called into this active pursuit of what God has in our life. Hear it in Paul's words. He goes on to to, to say it as he thinks about it and says it later in Philippians. He says in Philippians 3, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. He says, I am not there yet. I, I haven't arrived in what he has, but I'm pressing. That's a pretty powerful words, by the way. I'm pressing. I'm pressing on because I want it. I want what God has for me. He goes on to say, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I am reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I want that. And I'm actively pursuing it. He goes on to say, I press. I am pressing towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It is this recognition of this passionate pursuit, this desire that says, I want to do this. I want to be all in, that I'm longing for what God has, that there would be a sense that that's exactly what he has for me. And I'm just telling you, that becomes a big part of our Christian life. And if you only got this part out of this whole message, I just gotta tell you, I think it would do good on your life. Because somehow, somehow, some of us have thought that spiritual maturity could happen without us. You know, as if somehow we didn't have to actually do anything. That somehow we didn't have to, you know, really step up and step into reading our Bible and praying and pursuing Christ as if somehow it would happen automatically. It does not. He's telling you, hey, step in, like pursue this. I mean, if you want this, you need to do this. And there's a place where what needs to happen in our lives is that we long for that. I think about it, Paul would use so many metaphors through this. The Bible would, he'd talk about it in Corinthians where he would say, you know, you know, all run in a race, but only one receives the prize. You run so you can win. Run so that you can say, I want to, to catch that. I want to see what that would look like. And so there becomes this place where we begin to understand the comparison between the two. Yeah, bodily exercise takes intention. So does spiritual exercise. It takes purposeful intention to do it. It's perhaps the greatest battle. 
Well, let's go on. Well, so that's maybe one of them. That's maybe the first kind of phrase that we'd use. If you were to walk into a, a gym again, maybe you would see something, maybe it would say like, commit to be fit. It's a good, a good, you know, little axiom, a little kind of encouragement. And again, it's one of the great problems. I reached out to a few people over the last few weeks, some of you here in this fellowship and some outside and people who take fitness really just powerfully. If I didn't ask you, it's not because I don't think you're fit, by the way. Just, I just asked a few people. Don't take insult from that. Just thought I'd toss that out. Um, but I asked, I said, so what would you say? What would you think are the big things that people need to be physically fit? What are the big struggles? And if sure, the first one was that. It really is. Hey, you got to do it. But the second one was that the greatest thing that people said was needed was a commitment. That there needs to be a consistency. If physical exercise is going to be at work in your life, then there must be a persistence. It has to become a habit. That there, that for physical exercise to actually work and do what it's meant to do, it has to become something that you do and you don't let excuses get in there. It's a commitment that you have that you don't break. And again, I, I found myself talking to someone, they, were just, they, they talked at length about this. They said, you know, one of the big problems that people have with exercise is that they are just so open to excuses. You know how it works. I mean, some of you are like, I mean, you know how, if you're this person, you know, if, if you're like, it just doesn't take much at all. Oh, the dew point. It's just a little bit too humid. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I just, you know, I'm not sure it's a good time for me to exercise. You know, it's, well, you know, I'm not sure my tummy's a little, I, I don't know how, and it just takes so little to knock you off your game. But if you're serious about your exercise, you know, no, you can't do that. You, you have to be committed in such a way that you do it whether you feel like it or you don't. And that you have a commitment to walking in and that kind of thing because you recognize that consistency becomes the only way to physical health. In fact, it's worth you saying, one good exercise doesn't make you physically fit. Now we've all done it. Okay, well, I've done it. I'm assuming you've done it, but maybe you've had that time like you did go to the gym and it was a really good like workout and you're like, man, it's great. And the next day you're already in the mirror like, oh, you know, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You know, just kind of seeing, did it already work? You know, just kind of curious, did it already transform everything? And it's like, no, it's not going to work. And somehow you have to have this conversation. It's like, one time was good. It's going to take a whole bunch more. <laughs> I mean, it's gonna, we got to do that consistently before we really see the, the product of what, because that's how physical exercise works. Now, we know that. We understand that physically. But let's then take that over to where we are spiritually. That spiritually, it needs to become something that becomes consistent. And yet the same thing that sometimes happens to people physically happens spiritually. Sometimes people assume because they have one good Bible study, I mean, it's a really good Sunday. I uh, just really good. And so then they're like in the mirror, you know, am I spiritually fit? You know, kind of just want to curious, you know. And, and then when it's not, well, I guess it didn't work. You know, I, I, I prayed, read my Bible, and I'm not all better now. So maybe it didn't work. And then somehow you lost, well, yeah, got, that's what you needed to do and then keep doing that. The same way that physical fitness works, spiritual fitness works, it's not a one-time thing. It's a place where you begin to make it a habit, where you say, okay, these are things that I do, and I don't not do them. I do them without just stopping. I have a, a habit of these things in my life, and to be spiritually fit, there's no other way. One of my favorite examples is Daniel. In the book of Daniel, you, you get into the early chapters of it, and you find this young man, probably a teenager or younger even, being taken into the, the, the kingdom of Babylon, and it gives us this picture into his life. It tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself, not to eat the king's delicacies, if you know those things. He made a decision, but it's just really fascinating the way it said it. He decided inside. Kind of exercise yourself unto godliness. He decided, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be that type of person. And he makes this internal commitment to be different, to, to live a different life. And then you fast forward decades. Decades. I mean, he was probably a young man, teenager or younger. You get into Daniel chapter 6, and he's an old man now. I mean, he's gone through successive kingdoms. Decades have gone there. And you get this picture in Daniel chapter 6, and it says that Daniel knelt down on his knees three times that day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, and here's kind of the key, as was his custom since early days. 
Yet Daniel's in this amazing place. In fact, if you know the whole story of Daniel 6, prayer had just become illegal, but he keeps praying. But part of the reason he's able to do that is because he's got a spiritual habit, a custom in his life. He's like, I pray every day. In fact, I pray three times a day. Now, that's not a legalistic thing. You don't have to do that. This isn't saying, like, if you don't pray three times a day. It's, I'm just going to tell you that was his spiritual habit. It might be a good habit for you, by the way. Maybe some of you are thinking through, like, what, what would spiritual exercise look like in my life? And for somebody, you might want to think, I'm going to be like, Daniel, uh, there's going to be three times a day, every day, that I set aside to, 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 to spend time in prayer. Or maybe you'll pray through the Lord's Prayer every day. That's one of my spiritual habits. There's, there's things that become a part of it, but you find Daniel that's here, and you find this incredible godly man, but the surpri- it shouldn't be a surprise that he is such because he has been consistently doing the things that need to be done. And I'm just trying to tell you, hey, that becomes one of the great needs in our life, that if we want to be the people that God wants us to be, there is no other way to do it. There is no instant success. You guys know this, right? I mean, I'm just telling you, it's a weird world we live in, is it not? We live in a world that though this is simply true, people are always looking for easy fixes. It happens every January, usually like right after the holidays. You know, they'll begin kind of having these ads and they'll come up with, you know, some, you know, this pill will erase all fat in your life. You know, like take this pill and you can destroy everything. And and we're like, oh. Oh, that'd be great. Can I get healthy and not exercise? You know, and not have to eat good? That would be amazing. And it just, it never works. Those are lies. But something about us longs for that physically, and the same thing happens spiritually. Instead of people looking and thinking, okay, I want to be godly. I need to begin reading my Bible every day. I need to be in praying. I need to begin kind of having some consistent spiritual habits in my life. We look for quick fixes. Like, is there a book? Is there a conference I could go to? And we want like this, you know, and, and, and then it, does, we, we, it doesn't work that way. Spiritual growth happens just like exercise. It's, it's a long commitment. And one of the great keys is to become committed. It's true physically. Again, for some of you, you could say it better than I'm saying it right now. You've figured out that the only way to be physically healthy is to have a commitment that you don't break. But would to God you'd have the same commitment spiritually. Can I even give you just a bonus thought? When you have a commitment that you don't break, you actually free your life from a whole series of battles that you no longer have to face. If you are in a place where you're open to excuses You're always open to excuses. And in a sense, you are inviting your flesh to give you problems, and you're inviting Satan to give you problems. So here's how it works. One of the spiritual disciplines that's good in our life is coming to church. That that would be just a habit in our life that we just do that. But for some of you, here's the deal. It's not. And I don't mean that in a a negative way, but here's how it worked, because it happened this morning. You were waking up this morning, and then you began thinking. So will I go to church or will I not? I don't know, do I think about it? And, and you laid there under, and, and, and you thought about it for, and here's what happens. You might not have realized it, but you basically said, give me your best go, Satan. Like, try to talk me out of it, because I'm, 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 I, I, I'm movable in this whole thing. And here's the deal. I mean, for somebody here this morning, you're just barely here. I mean, you're like, man, you don't know, Jim. I mean, I had the covers, and I was laying there, and it was like, should I just close my eyes? And you're like, I just barely beat it. I mean, but I'm here. We're glad you're here. But I'm telling you, if that's where you do your life every Sunday, or that's how you do your life every day when you pray, you basically are inviting Satan. Hey, pick on me. Give me a reason not to do it. But if you come to the place that you have a habit, it's like not even a choice. I read my Bible. That's what I do. I I pray. That's what I do. I do it every day. I mean, there's not a, there's not a, whether I feel like it or I don't feel like it, whether it's a good day or a bad day, whether I'm in a good mood or a bad mood, I, I pray, I read my Bible, I go to church or whatever the exercises are that are key in your life. You get to the place where it's like, I recognize consistency is essential to spiritual health. I'm just telling you it is. It's true physically. You can never be physically healthy without consistency. You can never be spiritually fit or healthy without consistency. Those are perhaps the two greatest battles that people face. But let's add to it. There's a whole bunch more, but let me just give you a couple more. 
So you walk into the gym, you're looking for an exercise slogan. One of the ones you'll see, you guys would recognize it, no pain, no gain. Uh, you know what that is, right? I mean, you kind of get that. Before we go there, let's just quickly pause and say, you can overdo it, don't do it. I mean, it just, it is one of those things, I mean, not all pain is good in physical exercise. I mean, some of you, you've done that, like you haven't exercised for a year or so, and then you go to the gym and you overdo it. You're like, ah, I'm going to kill this thing. And, and then you just actually destroy your, that, that, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a good balanced approach in this that ought to be there. And that, there's some spiritual application there too that I'm not going to talk about too much, but just say it's true. That being said, you also understand that without tension, there's no growth. I mean, if you're really wanting to grow, like you're wanting to, to bulk up and, and build some muscle, You'll never do that unless you actually press yourself a little bit. You know how that works. You begin to, to lift weight, and you begin to think, hey, I'm going to lift a little harder. I'm going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to increase the weight. I want to feel that burn. I need to feel something that's actually saying I'm doing something. Or maybe it's running, and you're like, okay, I'm going to get a little faster. I'm, I'm going I'm to hit that mile a little bit quicker. Because I, I recognize, and for some of you, you know there's a, this place where there's a pressure, where there's a, a weight, where there's some strain, and the strain becomes necessary. Without strain, there's no growth. So you imagine this with me. I mean, imagine somebody sitting here this morning. It's not happening. It was first service. This isn't, so you guys are good. But first service, there might have been somebody who's like, man, I exercise every day. I do 15 curls every day with a TV remote, you know, it's like, man, there it is, I mean, and, and I'm totally going to become, I mean, watch these guns grow, no, you'd be like, that's not going to work, I mean, that's, that's, you, you want to you see something grow, you're going to have to actually do a little bit more than the TV remote, you know, I mean, there's just no, that's not really, that's not exercise, it, it's going to have to strain you just a little bit, or else there is no growth, and I just want to tell you, there is truth there spiritually as well, but see, here's the problem. For some people, they just don't connect it. Uh, they, they, they're in a place of like, I don't know why I'm not growing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I read the Bible. It's a minute and a half devotional that I've been doing for years, you know. I pray about 30 seconds, you know, and I keep, I, I just, I don't know why I'm not becoming a spiritual giant yet, you know. It's like, you know, I mean, I, but there's so, I mean, it's the equivalent of lifting the TV remote and expecting some, you know, huge spiritual benefit when there's not actually like, okay, this is, this actually costs me a little bit. This is actually, I'm having to press a little bit harder into these things because it actually is there, and yet there is truth there. Jesus said it this way. He said, then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And, and, and to you who hear, more will be given. Now, this is Jesus speaking, so again, I just wanted to make sure that's, that's authoritative. He says, I want you to take heed. I want you to pay attention to how you're hearing from God, how you're moving into the things of God. He says, whatever measure you bring to that, that's what you're going to take out of it. So if your measure is a thimble, it's like, well, yeah, you'll get a thimbleful. That's what you get. That, that's the investment you gave. That's what you're going to get. But if you come in with a bucket, then you're going to come out with a bucket. I mean, because you're, you're saying, God, I want more. It's not saying that it's up to us, but Jesus is saying, that's what I reward, that it, there's no way that this works outside of spiritual effort. You, you don't get it without that. To so that whatever measure you use, that you who hear, more will be given. Wow. One of my favorite pictures that picture this is in the book of Proverbs, and Solomon is speaking, and to that, it's almost like he's talking to his, his son. I just want you to hear it as this exhortation to be serious about this kind of pursuit. And he gives it to us this way. He says, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure them within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and you apply, you apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and you search for her as for hidden tre treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and his, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Hear it again. This is that same thing that's not all God or all us. God's saying, you know what, if you will pursue it, if you will hunger for it, if you'll hunt for it like you're hunting for silver, then God gives it. 
because he stores that up for us. It is him giving it, but it doesn't happen out of this active pursuit. But sometimes people almost think it's going to happen this way. I mean, it's almost like some people, and my, I have this visual in my mind that may, works for me, it may not work for you. Some people's spiritual pursuit is the equivalent of walking along a path and there's a rock in the way and they kick it. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's, it. That, that's as much buried treasure as I look for. It's got to be right there on the surface and easy to find. But someone is saying, you want it? Dig for it. Search for it. Search for it like you are hunting for buried treasure. Put in effort. Put in work. I mean, because that's what God rewards. There is a place of saying, hey, exercise spiritually. It is that, that it, it should be something that does require effort. I mean, it is. Whether that's in your Bible reading or your prayer time, or you're saying, okay, I just want to grow. I mean, I want to I invest into this. I'm not going to live in some low level. I want to move forward. It, it does take that, and I, maybe you totally get it. But I'm just telling you, I think there are some that just thought it would happen without effort, and it doesn't happen without that. God's inviting us to that. Well, let's add another. So you got to do it. you got to be committed. No pain, no gain. Same thing, you're walking into a gym, you're looking for an exercise slogan. One of them might say something like that you're seeking to have a healthy way of life. That's a good reminder. A healthy way of life because the idea is truly exercise, it's a lifestyle. It's not a destination. Real exercise is a lifestyle, not a destination. Goals are good. Goals can be helpful. And they can be helpful in exercise. Maybe, again, it's seeking to lose a certain amount of weight or maybe, again, maybe you're trying to run a mile and you want to hit this specific speed. Or, again, maybe you're trying to do, to do something. Having goals can be a good thing. But one of the things that's really important to really be serious about exercise is to recognize actually the real goal is to be exercising and never to stop. I mean, because it is this way that I'm not aiming to hit a goal. I'm aiming to exercise. Now, I don't know if this works for you. I'm just telling you it does for me. Every now and then, when I'm exercising, I almost have to remind myself of that. It's like, okay, well, yeah, I, I am trying to maybe go a little farther. I am trying to do just a little bit more. But you know what? This is the real goal, to be doing this, to be exercising. That's actually what I, the, the goal is, is not the destination. The goal is, hey, to be healthy, to be doing that. And there comes to this place that there's no end of that. Physically, there never should be. The exercise, it changes in life and, and what we do, but to be, the, to be healthy, exercise should, can and should always be a part of our lives. Now, that's something that you guys probably know, but let's again apply it spiritually. Spiritual health really is aiming to this place that goals can be helpful. Sometimes setting a goal like, I want to read the whole Bible this year. That can be a good goal. Or I want to pray through all of Paul's prayers. Or I want to, you know, do, there are goals that are, that are helpful to set, but they're not the end of the whole thing. That what God is looking for, what, it, what he's actually calling us into is a place that that would be something that we consistently do in our lives. That the real goal is just to be consistently doing these things to be consistently in the word, to consistently in prayer, to be consistent in those things, because it's got to be a present reality. If physical exercise or spiritual exercise is just a memory, it doesn't really help you any longer. Uh, you know what I mean by that, right? Maybe you've met somebody who's like, man, I used to be so healthy. I could run so fast back in college. It was great. It's like, oh, that's good. What about now? <laughs> it's like, well, you know, it's not, well, that didn't help you. I mean, that was good. That was good for then. But if you're going to be healthy now, then it takes now. And, and so what the aim is, is always about consistently making these a part of our lives to the place that would never move from that. That would be a place that I like the way it says it, exercise yourself toward godliness. Like we're in this, this journey that we'll never reach it till we get to it, but, but I'm, I'm never going to stop moving. We already talked about it, but Paul gives us such a good picture of that in Philippians 3, where he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. That's a lifestyle. That's a spiritual lifestyle saying, I'm not settled. 
I'm not content with where, where I am. I know there's more. And I'm not, just because I did yesterday, I'm not living in that. Today, I'm pressing into everything that God has for me. And that becomes something, the only way to be spiritually healthy is to have such a mentality where it begins to just permeate our lives. Again, just applying these things become helpful. Let me give you one more. Again, there's dozens of these we could think through, but as we're thinking about things that are true physical exercise, spiritual exercise, if you go into a gym, you find a motivational poster, one of them would say, use it or lose it. That's just simply true. I mean, you guys understand this physically, right? I mean, it is that way. Without physical exercise, your muscles will deteriorate. End of story. That's just how it works. For some of you, this is very present. The kind of thing that Maybe you were exercising, and you did really good, and you'd gotten to such a place that you could run so far or lift so much, and then you stopped. And then it takes weeks or a month, and you're getting back into it. And the funny thing is as soon as you're like, wow, I can't do what I, I, I already lost it. I can't do what I did even, I mean, just this little bit of space has already begun a deterioration that my muscles have declined because I stopped. You gotta, you lose, you gotta use it or you will lose it. Now, there's a lot to say in this, but I wanted to say it in a, as an encouragement because this isn't the past, this is about the present. And this is really meant to be an encouragement. And the thing is that exercise is always supposed to be a part of our life. That it can be a part of that. And physically, I could tell you stories. You guys know them. Maybe you've seen some of those things on YouTube or stories of somebody who is you know, overweight or even in their, uh, in their more elderly years and they begin exercising. And what an incredible difference it makes. It always does. But it's a present thing where it's like, okay, I'm going I'm to use where I am. I'm going to take forward because I'm, I want to just move forward in that. That is true. And again, probably understood physically, but I just want to translate that spiritually because the same is true. The thing is that if you stop, you begin losing the very things that you gained. Jesus said it this way. He says, therefore, take heed how you hear, for whoever has to him more will be given and whoever does not have. Even what he seems to have will be taken from him. It's just simply very true. In other words, spiritual maturity doesn't stay there. You can be a place that like you, you grow, but he says you stop. You, you, you're no longer listening. You're no longer hearing from God. Then those things which you thought you have, you begin to lose. It begins this decline. There's no way to stay spiritually healthy without maintaining there's just something so helpful about understanding that and seeing this. And, and I know that for some of you, you could actually look at it. I, I was talking to somebody after first service, and they were saying, you know, one of the spiritual disciplines they used to have in their life was memorizing scripture and how they, you know, they got that place and then they stopped. And then they, went, they just recently got back into it and they realized how much they'd already lost. It's like, man, I lost all these things that I'd invested into. They're gone. I, I mean, I would have thought, but I lost what I gained. And I need to get back into that. There becomes a place where Hebrews would say it to us this way. Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. And we've got we to gotta, like, pay attention and step into it, because if we don't, it, it, we lose it. And that is so incredibly true. So I, I think about these things, and I've just given you a few this morning, thinking about these ideas of comparing physical exercise to godly exercise, and I just want to tell you, it's just the beginning. For some of you, I just want to ask you, hey, think this through for a moment. Things that you understand about physical exercise, I just want to ask you to begin thinking them through spiritually. I mean, there's more we could say. We could talk about those who recognize that, you know, there are times in, in, in your physical exercise you need to change it up. Sometimes you need to let certain muscles rest and, and try different habits. Same is true spiritually. Same is true spiritually. We could talk about things like total workouts, the idea that if you're going to be healthy, you can't just work out one muscle, you know, like your finger or something like that. It's like, I have the strongest finger out there. You know, I, I'm totally healthy. No, you've got to have a whole thing. Spiritually, it's the same. Yeah, you, you need to be in the Word, but you also need to grow in prayer. That you can't just kind of pick up. I mean, there, there's, there's aspects to this that you could take and, and, and apply in ways that I, I think are helpful, but I want to just come back to it in the most simple way and tell you this is an encouragement and this is a command. Exercise yourself toward godliness. Exercise yourself toward godliness. I just want to tell you that should be a part of your spiritual life and maybe it actually is. Maybe you actually understand this or maybe somehow you've believed a lie. Again, I, I know I'm talking to somebody who just 
somehow began to believe a lie that it doesn't work for you. That you thought, well, you know, there are those spiritual people that seem to just take the Bible seriously and they do so well and they just, it's probably in their DNA or something like that. But the real deal is, is they've, they've pursued it and you haven't, but you can. And nobody gets here without intentionally saying, okay, I'm gonna exercise myself. I'm gonna exercise myself towards godliness and that becomes the great need. And let me go back to that verse just for a moment and then we'll begin to wind it up there. We, we talked about this verse a moment ago, and I absolutely love it there in Philippians 2. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. These two things do go hand in hand, and we've talked about this idea, and I like it. Work it out, and we've kind of used the, the exercise kind of idea, and that's just work out. <laughs> like, you should, you should work out, and it's partly there, but to be really clear, the idea of working out isn't just talking of exercise, but almost fully apply. But I think either way, it's still, still saying the same thing, that he's telling you and I that with, with an expectation of recognizing we need to intentionally apply ourselves to our Christianity. But I want to come back to the idea that it, what it says there, that, that it's not just in your control, nor just in your power. For it is God who works in you to, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. I hope in nothing that I'm saying this morning would I feed your own self-effort outside of leaning into Christ, outside of abiding in Christ, because the only way to, to grow in the things of God is to grow in Christ. And you, you absolutely need him to help you and him to be the power of that. He comes alongside that desire and that's what you want to do. And I simply want to encourage it. This place where yes, you're seeking to do it, but yes, you're seeking to do it in his power. But one last thought, you know, we think about this whole idea of what we've talked about this morning, work out. I want you just to notice it is an idea of working out your own salvation. This is a message given to Christians and saying, hey, take what God has given us and fully permeate our lives with it. Let me be very clear. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, if you're watching online this morning and you're not a Christian, this is not going to work for you. The Christian life is not just seeking to do some disciplines that are supposedly Christian, where you read your Bible or pray. I think about the way it gives it to us in Ephesians 2, where Paul says, in you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. And I don't want to be too morbid or too weird about it, but I just think it's helpful. Trying to get somebody who's not a Christian to do spiritual exercise is kind of like taking a corpse to the gym. I just want to say it's a little bit weird because we're like, okay, I'm just totally weirded out by that. But um, I just want to tell you, it doesn't work because without life, you can't exercise. You can't physically, I mean, if you're dead, there's, not, there's nothing you can do to fix that by, by putting someone on a treadmill. It's not going to do anything for them without life. And yet he goes on to, so, but God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, I need to tell you, that's what you need. You need life in Christ, and it's not something you can do. It's what he did, what Jesus did to die on the cross for you. It's, it's his great love that would say, he would take you who is dead, and Jesus said, you'd make you born again. He would give you new life in Christ, and you desperately need that. And please understand, that's where it has to begin. But when you get that, you get to what we've talked about this morning in Philippians, and it's not a way of earning our salvation or maintaining our salvation. It's fully enjoying our salvation. The idea is take that salvation that God gave you and use it. Uh, take that salvation that he gave you and, and, and permeate every aspect of your life with that. It's not how you get saved. It's enjoying your salvation, enjoying the good work that Jesus did for you. And in that, there becomes this effort that says, I want to do it, not because I'm trying to earn God's favor. I'm just trying to walk with him. I want to pursue what he has in my life. And I'm telling you, that's a good pursuit. This place where you would exercise yourself for godliness. So you can close your Bibles, notebooks, whatever it is you have open. And I want to just invite you then just to take this before the Lord for a moment in prayer with me. I don't know what God has spoken to you this morning. Again, maybe you're here this morning, you don't know him. you got to begin with life in him. We invite you to Christ. And even now that you would pray and surrender your life to God and then maybe come and talk to us after service, we'd love to do that. But if you're a Christian, 
God has given you this incredible salvation and maybe you fully understood it, that you need to work out that salvation, that you need to exercise yourself towards godliness. To the extent that you've already figured that out, just I invite you to talk to God about that. But for some of you, it's in a place of just recognizing, mm, I've somehow believed a lie, that this was going to happen on its own, that it was going to produce its own maturity all by itself, and, and forgot that, no, there's an exercising myself towards godliness. So whatever God has spoken to you about this morning, I invite you in this moment of prayer, ask him to help you, and just that he would work in you to will and to do for his good pleasure as you seek to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You talk to God about that in prayer, I'll do the same, and they'll come back and worship in just a moment. Jesus, I think about what you said, that we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. Lord, I'm asking for that this morning, that you would take these words and just permeate our lives with your truth. Lies that somehow have kept some Christians living in immaturity without actually recognizing that they need to be exercising themselves towards godliness that you invite us, command us, desire us to have a, a godly pursuit in our life that is consistently, actively pursuing what you have for us, that our growth doesn't happen outside of that. Simple, I suppose, and yet so many lies that lock us down, and so I just ask that you'd rescue us. And then, Lord, you would draw us. You would draw us to be a people who indeed work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And yet, Lord, that's not the end of the sentence. We recognize as we do that, what we so desperately need is that you would work in us to will and to do for your good pleasure. And I simply ask for it. Teach us, help us to go and just pursue you more. I ask for that now in, for me and for us here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God meet you in that. May he encourage you daily. May he encourage you today just to pursue him and everything that he has for you. If you need to talk to somebody, want someone to pray with, hey, we're here after the service. Pastor Phil will be up front. We have several others. Make your way up. We'd love to talk to you. But right now, why don't you stand? We're going to close with worship and longing in this worship that we just would make God that focus, that pursuing of him. And to that aim, I just want to bless you in his name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and, and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.